So you see how God, the Holy Spirit speaks to, to us jointly. And um, this is kind of what I was going to talk about in a, in a different angle. So I wanted him to hear that. And now he's getting water. <laughs> You're part of the story. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> leave you out. Kevin, what you said, at the end of the camp on Sunday, I saw, I, I mentioned to you that I felt the Lord show me this tent wall and that there was a gap underneath that uh, I saw a man go underneath it to get into the presence of God. But like we're trying to cl climb above that tent wall and go over it. And we can't do that. It's about humbling ourselves to come into the presence of God and to come into the gifts of God. And we can't do it by striving to get higher and higher. <clears throat> so that is awesome that God would prepare the sermon by speaking through you like that. And that message really is for all of us. So uh, there's, there's one particular aspect to humbling ourselves that is critical to gaining that acceptance and that presence of God. And that, that's what I want to talk about today. It's really activating the power of the new covenant. The power of the new covenant. The power of forgiveness. The, the, the cleansing of our sins. Uh, we want the gifts of God. We want the new covenant which talks about everything is forgotten. Everything is forgiven. We are fully redeemed in Christ by His blood. But there's the old covenant. And there's a purpose for the old covenant. It wasn't just there so that it, it wouldn't have an effect on us. And Paul talks about it in Romans and, and elsewhere. But he talks about why we need the Old Covenant. Why did God give the laws of Moses? Why did the Jews have 600 laws in effect before the New Covenant came? To say, don't do this, do this, don't touch that, don't eat this. And why do we have the Ten Commandments and many other commandments of God? Well, there's a pastor, I'll call him a pastor, his name was Ezekiel, and he was a prophet to the nation of Israel. And God called him out by the Holy Spirit to preach to the people. And one of the things that he said to get the people's attention was in Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 30 to 32. And God says to Ezekiel, Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel. When I say house of Israel, it's the children of God. Everyone according to his ways declares the Lord God, repent and turn from all your transgressions. That's all your sins. Lest iniquity be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God. So turn and live. Now, it's interesting, at this point, he's telling Ezekiel to tell the children of God that they must make themselves have a new heart and a new spirit. What follows this is God brings Ezekiel into the valley of the dry bones. And all of the nation of Israel, like one big army of bones, is scattered through the valley. There's no life in them, there's no flesh on them, and the word of God says the bones were very dry. If I'm going to speak to bones as a pastor or to myself and I tell the bones that they have to live, that they have to have a new heart, the bones can't help themselves. They're dead. They're dry. There's no life in them. The old covenant speaks to the bones, speaks to us and says, you get holy. You fix yourself up. You follow the rules. Or you will die. Or you will perish. And in the presence of a holy God, you can't come. You can't be redeemed unless you fulfill all the requirements of the law. Now at one point, when Ezekiel speaks to the bones. Oh, excuse me. Let me add this. Ezekiel 33, verses 30 to 32. As for you, son of man, your people who talk together about you by the walls and at the doors of the houses, say to one another, each to his brother, come and hear what the word is that comes from the Lord. And they come to you as people come, like people come into church. And they sit before you as you're sitting here today as my people. And they hear what you say, but they will not do it. 
For with lustful talk in their mouths they act. Their heart is set on their gain. And behold, you are to them like one who sings lustful songs with a beautiful voice and plays well on an instrument. For they hear what you say, but they will not do it. As a pastor, I preach to many people. And I've even had God specifically tell me about problems that people suffer from. And I say it to them. And they will weep. And then they will turn and go back into the sin that God just warned them about. I see that many times. But I saw them cry. I, and I know they confirmed what they said, that what I told them was true. But they couldn't do it. And just like the bones, they can't do it. You can't do it. The sin that you're suffering from, the problems, the agony in your heart, you can't overcome it even though God said you must. This would be unfair. But there is a remedy. You're not under the new covenant until the old covenant has worked on you. Until you have been labored over by your burden. If you have been dealing with arrogance, which so many of us do, and you're out to try to, this isn't just Kevin Stewart, but since you brought it up, and you're trying to make money because you, this is not about you, Kevin, okay, I'm just using this as an example, and you're working really hard because you're hot stuff, you're smart, you're a good businessman, and you labor and labor and labor, and then finally at the end of the week you're exhausted, and you're not happy, and your wife's not happy at you because you weren't home, and your kids don't see you all week, and you realize in your heart, you said, I've done something wrong. I'm trying to do the right thing, but I am not. There are other people that will go through the same thing, and there is no conviction. They would never stand here the way Kevin just stood before you today. They keep on going, and it keeps getting worse. And they keep trying to prove that they're good without ever repenting or confessing that sin. And there is no activation of the new covenant without the humility, without the profession of your sin. Did Jesus come and take away the law? Let's listen to what he said. Matthew 5, 17 to 18 and verse 20. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Verse 20, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, Jesus twists the screws deeper and further. The law. Now Jesus talks about not just your actions, but he also talks about what's in your heart. And he says, even if you lust for a woman in your heart, you are sinning, you are committing adultery. You haven't touched her. It's just been in your heart. Why would Jesus do this? To draw us further down to the ground and to realize our weakness in contending with sin. He's applying the old covenant deeper and stronger until you say, I can't take it anymore. I can't live with this burden of sin on my life. Do you think God is more concerned with the sin of the people outside of the church or in the church? In your house, is your father more concerned about you or the neighbor's kid? You belong to Jesus. The sin in a believer's heart is what grieves God the most. It is our sin. Even though we have Jesus, He weeps over our sin. And we know that there is an effect on our life with sins that we deal with. Now the Bible says all sin. Jesus tells us that. David says it. Solomon said it says everyone sins. Everyone sins. There's no shame in acknowledging that. In fact, that's the key to freedom. It is acknowledgement that I sin and that I cannot wash this away myself. And that's the purpose of the law. Repent and turn from your transgressions. 
This is an issue that we all deal with. I'll tell you, those that want to come closer to God and that the Holy Spirit's drawing will feel this constantly. There's a nagging issue on your heart all the time. God, why do I keep sinning? I don't want to sin. Help me get out of this sin. If you don't feel that way, and you just keep sinning, and it doesn't bother you, that's when you have a problem. Remember Pharaoh. He saw the mighty miracles of God, and he was confronted with the fact that God was real. He knew that. He knew what he was doing was wrong in the eyes of God. But God said he hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he would continue to disobey him further and further. And the Bible talks about the hardening of a heart. If we continue to sin against God after the Holy Spirit continues to warn us, and we get to the point where no longer it bothers us, and we have a false comfort in the fact that we say we're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, but we go on sinning and it doesn't affect our conscience. That's the danger zone. David was a great warrior for God. David was a humble man. He was persecuted. He was treated unfairly. Every relationship he had, he had problems with Michal, his wife, and with Saul, the king, and, and just persecuted. And, and he had to humble himself. Even when Saul was treating him unfairly, he had to forgive Saul. <clears throat> but David, as he became king, as he became more powerful, and his he started to shine in his own glory. And when all of his soldiers went out to war, he stayed back in the palace. And he looked over the roof, out, uh, onto the roof, uh, and saw Bathsheba taking a bath naked, another man's wife. He takes her, has an illegitimate child with her, sets it up that her innocent husband, who was faithful and loyal to him, would die in combat, effectively was responsible for his murder. And it didn't bother him until Nathan the prophet comes to David. And specifically, just like I told you, sometimes God, your friend, I believe the Lord spoke to your friend and wanted you to hear it from him because you remembered it. It had a stronger impact on you. I've had that in my own life. Someone says to you, you know, you've got a problem with this. You think, oh my gosh, you know. Coming out of somebody else's mouth, you know God's speaking to them. It's scary. So David had this experience with Nathan. And at that point, David humbles himself. And he feels so grieved over his sin. Up until that point, he's headed for destruction. But thank God that he reached out and he had mercy on David and confronted him with it. But Nathan said in this process, he says, but God has already forgiven your sins. This is amazing. David had not yet repented of the sin, but Nathan is telling him, God has already forgiven you. Forgiven before he even said, I'm sorry. Why? Because he's a child of God. If you read in Psalm 89 and, and, and uh, Isaiah 57, God talks about his forgiveness for his children. Let me read you Psalm 57. Oh, excuse me, Isaiah 57. Isaiah 57, verses 15 to 19. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit. In other words, you just did what Kevin says. You, you are humbling yourself to God to revive the spirit of the lonely and to revive the heart of the contrite. For I will not contend forever, nor will I always be angry. For the spirit would grow faint before me and the breath of life that I made. Because of the iniquity of his unjust gain, I was angry. I struck him. I hid my face and was angry, but he went on backsliding in the way of his own heart. I have seen his ways, but I will heal him. I will lead him and restore comfort to him and his mourners, creating the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to the far and to the near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. If you're just humble. If you just admit you're having a problem with sin, if you confess it to God, you will be healed. You're already, if you've already put your faith in Jesus Christ and said, I repent and turn to you, 
and then you go on and you sin later on, but you're humble about it, and you repent of that sin, he says, don't worry about it. I will heal you. I will change you. I will make you the man and woman I want you to be. He takes responsibility for the conformity of your soul into the image of Christ. When you say, I repent, I confess my sins. You see, the power of the new covenant comes by you just humbling yourself. And now you say, God, help me. Jesus, I turn this over to you. But you can't as long as you're trying to fix the problem. If, if, if David just ignores, excuse me, Kevin just ignores the, the warning of his friend or gets mad and hostile at him, repentance is not just saying, I'm sorry. It's a conviction. It's something we can't create on our own. David could not create the conviction in his heart that led him to just fall to the ground and not sleep, not eat, not wash or shower. It happened when God touched his heart. You can't confess your sins and repent unless God touches you. You can say you're sorry. That's not what I'm talking about. There's a lot of superficial confession that isn't really confession at all. It won't change you, and you can test it, because you go right back into your sin. But when God touches your heart, when the Holy Spirit touches your heart, and you're convicted deep down inside, I've seen people, I can tell, they come to me, and Pastor, I'm having a problem with this, you know, and I can tell they're no more engaged in that problem than, than anything else. You know, it's, it's like talking to a rock. But they're saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. They'll say it a thousand times. And there is no change. And there are other people that have even sinned greater. But when Holy Spirit talks to them and touches them and gives them a conviction on their heart, they weep and cry. They pour themselves out just like they're dying. And then I said, wow. <laughs> and then the Bible says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And then you see a change in their life. That's repentance. But if we keep going on, this is your problem, not mine. You go to the pastor and you say, pray for me. If you're not engaged in the process, I can be praying over a rock. Right. It's your soul, your judgment day, your sin. You must take responsibility for it. Take ownership for it. And if you don't feel repentive, like I just told you, who do you talk to? God! Holy Spirit, change me. Give me a heart of repentance. God, help me to hate my sin. We're not supposed to hate anybody. But there's one thing we have to hate. It's sin. Paul talks about sin as if it's a person. He says sin is alive in you. And it must die. And you can't kill it with flesh because we're talking about a supernatural battle here. You need the Holy Spirit I prayed for people, and you, at the camp you saw God moving, some of you felt Him. But I've noticed that some people that are not repentive, when I pray for them, nothing happens. Just like, well, I didn't feel anything. Well, all these people did. Why? Because the Holy Spirit touched the heart to make them able to receive. And those people typically have been humbled in their life. And God has given them a heart of repentance and a need for God, a reliance on the power of the Holy Spirit. We have to pray, God, give me a fear of you. Without the fear of the Lord, we just go on doing what we want to do. This world will entice us in every way. There is entertainment. There is, I talk about this often, television, music, relationship. There's all kinds of great little goodies, especially in Northern Virginia, where people are pretty well off and comfortable. And that is enough to keep you busy from focusing on your own sin. Isn't it easier to get up and turn on the TV than to get down on your knees and pray to God? There's a Puritan author, Thomas, Thomas Brooks, Thomas Watson, Thomas Watson talks about repentance and says that if men were more eager to repent of their sins than they were to entertain themselves, how much greater would the power of God be in their life? Isn't that true? I can easily pursue the pleasures of this world 
And I can stop thinking about the sin in my life. But it is good and healthy to look and meditate on your sins. How do I know this? Because this is what I contended with. I got free one time of sin that was in my life. All, just every day it was on my heart. I, I just didn't know what to do with it. And one day I sat in my chair. And as I usually do, I pray in the morning. And this time, instead of wrestling with this issue over and over again in my mind, I just looked to God. And I just silently sat there and I said, Holy Spirit, show me the root of this sin in my life. And as I'm sitting there, I saw some unconnected images, not related to the issue that I thought I had. And it was something, like someone had did something mean to me when I was in 8th grade or 7th grade. This is quite a long time ago. Not so much for many of you. But why, in other words, this is something that I could not have thought about. It just came in, pop, I saw this person's face. And then uh, I felt the Lord say, forgive him. <laughs> This is a hundred years ago. I, I don't even remember what happened. He said, forgive it. So I did. I said it out loud. I, I don't even remember the person's name. I just saw the face. And when I did, I just felt, whoa. I just felt a release. And, and then I, I, I said, okay, Holy Spirit, go deeper into my heart. And I just, I didn't try to think about anything, just God. And then I could feel this release in my heart, and I felt freedom. <laughs> He's willing to help and to show but don't try to solve every problem on your own mind and your own ability. It won't work. There are deeper issues that we don't know about. Only God can point out to us. So, avoidance of thinking you're better than everybody else. Thinking that you don't have to sin. Thinking that Jesus, is ta Jesus has taken care of your sins, but that doesn't mean your heart will be free without confession. It's for you. Now David, after he sinned, he still had salvation. But what happened? When we sin, we have problems in our families, in our relationships. And God said, I, you know, I will not spare the rod to discipline my children. In other words, yes, I'll forgive your sins. You're coming home with me when you die. But man, you're going to have hell to pay on this earth until you get that junk out of you. He's not concerned with your comfort, but your character. And David paid a heavy, heavy price. What happened? Thousands of Jewish soldiers died. Israel, Israelite soldiers died in combat. He gave birth to an illegitimate child. One of his best, honest commanders died in battle. His son died. His child died in birth. His other son, Absalom, whom he loved, turned against him. Raped his wife's, his, his uh, you know, back then they had large families. Raped his women in front of everybody, on the roof, so everybody could see. And the Lord said, what you've done in private, I will do in public, and everyone will see. There is nothing secret in our hearts, nothing God doesn't see, but it's for your good. He disciplines for your good, as awful as, awful as that was for David. And then his son, after raping his own daughter, turns against his father in, in combat, and there is a rebellion. And he is the one that pushes his father off of the throne. Particularly when it's a man in the household, someone in authority. You are responsible to live as holy a life as you can. To be quick to repent. Quick to repent of your sins. Because otherwise your family will suffer. God will use the closest things to you to get to your heart. To show you this matters. I see it over and over again. And even though you will not go to hell for the sin of your father, you'll live in it. If your father is in sin, you will suffer. Hasn't that happened? Divorce, arguments, loneliness, depression, financial issues, because dad is in sin. When you get older and your parents, you're going to have an impact on your kids. Sin. You profess the name of Jesus, you're saved. But why? Why would you want your kids to suffer? And when people talk to me about divorce, it turns my stomach. Why? Because my parents got divorced. Now, if someone's abusing you, you don't have a choice. There are certain, there's a limit where you have to go. 
But I remember how I felt when my parents were divorced. And the arguments that led up to them. Dreadful. I felt unloved. I felt empty. I felt horrible. I felt like I was the worst person in the world. And then, of course, your parents get divorced, and they start dating, so they have no interest in you. You're an afterthought. I had TV dinners. Watched TV, played games. When I was 16, I went out and got drunk. Why? Because nobody's focused on me. They're focused on their relationships with their new partners, with their jobs, with, with hating each other. The effect of sin affects, it still affects me to this day. There was financial issues. I, got, I was so poor the government had to pay for my college, had to give us food stamps. And the struggle and the strain. When I had a, a dance or something to go to in high school, I didn't have nice shoes. So my father loaned me. Did you hear what I'm saying? Loaned me his shoes and then took them back after I went. He didn't buy me another pair. Why? Because he hated my mother. Not because he hated me. He wanted to torment my mother. The effect of sin. So what happened? I hated him. Didn't want to talk to him. Think about what you're doing. Think about the sin in your heart. And the effect it will have on other people. And confess now. Confess before it gets worse. Confess before your heart is hard. Before your family's gone. Before no one wants to be around you, your children don't want to talk to you, or you don't want to talk to your parents, or whatever it is. Confess your sin. It is the activation of the new covenant. Romans 7, 14 to 19, and verse 24. Paul struggling with sin in his heart. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. See, he talks about sin as if it's a person. For I know that nothing good dwells in me. That is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? That's the cry in the heart that God needs to hear. That's what sets you free. And then it is saying, Holy Spirit, come and set me free. Jesus, come and set me free. I'm not good at setting myself free. I'm dead without you, Jesus. I don't want to live anymore like this. I don't want to live in the pain of my life anymore. I'm tired of my addiction, God. Save me. I'm a wretched man. I'm not a great man. I'm not a good man. I'm not a great woman or a good woman. I'm a, I'm a person who just needs help and healing. God, come and set me free. Ezekiel gets another message from God as he's looking at all the dead bones. And God says in Ezekiel 37, 9 to 14, Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath. This is the Holy Spirit, the word for Holy Spirit, Ruach, is the same word used here. Breath, prophesy to the breath. Speak to the Holy Spirit. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, to the Holy Spirit, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds. Again, winds. It is the same word for Holy Spirit, Ruach. O breath, Ruach, and breath, breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath of Ruach came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore I prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from the graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it, declares the Lord. Now you see. 
where we heard Ezekiel saying to the bed bones, you heal yourself. And now God says, tell the Holy Spirit to go into them. I'm going to send them. I'm going to change your heart. I'm going to do everything that you couldn't do for yourself. Turn to me. Confess your sins. Ask me to heal you. And now when you believe, you believe that the Holy Spirit has the power to raise you from the dead, away from your sins, and transform you, and give you a heart of flesh instead of stone. You have to believe. You can't just ask. But I trust you, God. This sin in my life, I believe you, Holy Spirit. I have not been able to conquer it, but you will. Declare it. Believe it. Trust Him. And that's why I'm such a big advocate for the Holy Spirit. Because I knew what it was like before I got filled with the power of God. I was a believer. And God talks about the bones coming up in the flesh, but they don't have the Holy Spirit on them yet. That's a believer who doesn't have the power of God in them yet. And that's what happened on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit is poured out. He said, wait in Jerusalem, because you're just a, you're just a body with flesh. Don't go anywhere and preach the gospel. Don't do anything until you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit says, I am alive. God comes into you and gives you power. What did Jesus do before he ascended to heaven? After he was resurrected from the dead. He looks at his disciples. And he breathes on them. And he says, receive the Holy Spirit. It's the same word, ruach. John 20, 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you notice at the camp, I will blow on people. I discovered this by accident. But it is the same manifestation of the Holy Ghost. And people will tell me they feel great peace. That is the deliverance and the power of God that takes you out of your sins. It is a real touch. It is the real fire of God. It can't be fake. It can't just be words on a page. He never said just speak to them. He said speak to the breath. I will put my breath in you, not just my word. The word only comes alive through the power of the Holy Spirit. You need that. Breath is life. When David was bitter in his sin. In Psalm 32, 1 to 11, he said, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in through my groaning all uh, in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. That is a person who's in sin but won't confess it. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my strength was dried up. As by the heat of summer, when we have sin in our life that's not confessed, you have no power, I know. You have no power to pray. You have no power to believe. You can't love people the way you're supposed to. All you want to do is watch TV or be on the Internet. You can't interact with your friends or your family. There's no life in you. There's no power in you. I'm talking about spiritual power. Inside, in your soul, in your heart, not on the outside. Sin just will destroy us. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly. See, godliness doesn't mean sin-free. Godliness means you belong to the Lord, and you're willing to confess your sins to Him. Amen. Offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found because it may be too late. You and I have a separate judgment day. One judgment day, a separate judgment for each of us. And the Bible says, Paul says in Romans, each man is accountable for all they've done. Gentile and Jew, believer, non-believer. You can be saved, but there's still an accounting. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you. While you can still be rich. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with the shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go, God says. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule. Praying for people that are mules. Preaching to people that are mules. When the word of God comes and all they do is stay where they are. No repentance. No change. Sitting and sitting and sitting. And accountable. The scale is getting heavy without understanding. Without understanding. 
Man, if there's a verse in the Bible, if there's something you heard from the Lord, seek it out. What are you trying to say? Like Kevin pursued that. He let it come into his heart and he acted upon it and said it publicly. Pursue it. God, why do you say that I'm arrogant? Which must be curbed in a bit and a brittle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. And God says in Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27, I will sprinkle clean water on you. And you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart. You see? After he said, you have to get it. He says, don't worry about it. I know you can't do it anyway. I'm so glad you're struggling because now I can give it to you. And a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you, I will cause you, he says, to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You can't obey the word of God without the Holy Spirit. And we are still accountable for our walk with God. And that's the frustrating but most important aspect of being a Christian, is to know I am accountable for my sins even though he has saved me. But he will not be happy, and neither will I, walking in my sins. And the only way I can do that is to humble myself, confess my sins, and trust him to do it. And I need you, Holy Spirit. When I get up in the morning, I say, Holy Spirit, come upon me. Help me to obey the Lord. Transform my heart. Bring your presence with me, God, even in my office. I release the presence and the peace of God. I say it under my breath in the morning when I come into my office. Pray. Pray and trust the supernatural power of God, not your own ability. And no false humility. In Romans 5, 21, 22, fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. Your faith in believing that God is forgiven, has forgiven you, that he has power. It is all about faith. Faith in Him. Faith in Him. Faith in your deepest secrets. Faith that He will heal you. You can't get to repentance just by watching TV. This is not a, a video game. This is your soul. And the devil has lied to many of us to make us comfortable and lazy and non-committed. But if the Holy Spirit is speaking you today, like he spoke to Kevin, it is a great time to relieve yourself of the burden of sin and confess yourself to God. Now today, if you confess and nothing really comes out of your heart, take it home with you daily, every day. Ask God, give me a heart of repentance, Lord. Show me how evil my sins are. Show me what they look like to you. Today you can start asking him. God, what do my sins look like to you? Because it's different for him than it is for you and me. He hates sin, especially in his children. He died for us. The blood of Christ, precious blood of Christ, poured out for us. And then we, without any consciousness, continue on sinning. That's the grievous part of a Christian life. And to live every day aware that I must live in the holy love of God. So today, I'm going to give you a chance right now to pray. Confess your sins to God. If you feel like kneeling down, go ahead. I know it's a little odd because of the circumstances. But it is you and God. If we could have some worship music, it would be great. Thank you, brother. And then after you do this, I'm just going to ask each other to pray for one another, to encourage you, and to release the love of God that says, I know your sins, but I love you and I forgive you. That's what you'll do afterwards. Let me just get us started, but please... Jesus, precious Jesus. Holy Spirit, we ask you to show us the sinfulness in our hearts. 
Lord, not just that we know it's there, but we know how it grieves your heart. What does it look like to you, Lord? Holy Spirit, give us a seriousness that we pursue holiness. But Lord, not on our own flesh, that we can turn this battle, even though we grieve over it, God, but you're the one that's going to bring victory. And we ask you, Holy Spirit, come into our hearts and give us freedom today. Oh, Holy Spirit, come. Just show me what's in my heart right now, God. Any images you see, if it's someone that has harmed you that you need to forgive, or ask Him what the root of your problem is. God, show us, Lord God. We turn ourselves over to You. Because we want to be free. We want to, we want to live according to Your Spirit, according to Your Word. <coughs> Thank You for Kevin's testimony, God. Lord, you're so good, you provide an example for us. Holy Spirit, come upon me. Light of God, show me. Show me my sins, that I may confess them. Thank you, Lord, for loving me and caring for everything. Carrying my burdens away. I praise you, Lord, and thank you. Divine love of God, touch our hearts. Thank you for being faithful to forgive us, God. Take our burdens, God. You set us free. Holy Spirit, the Word says that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Bring freedom to me. prison of sin. I don't want to ruin my family or the relationships I have because of sin. Holy Spirit, I need your power. And if I'm not saved or I haven't been, God, I call out to you today. Maybe I've been pretending to be a Christian, but Lord, I know the new covenant comes when I put my faith in you. I trust you, God. I believe you, God. I believe that you died for my sins, that your blood has covered me. I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you rose from the dead on the third day. I believe you'll never leave me nor forsake me. And Lord, I repent and I turn to you. Please forgive me for faking it. Holy Spirit, come upon me and fill me. Jesus, you are the baptizer of fire. Fill me with fire. Healing fire. Lord, I trust your love. I trust your word, your promise that says you all, you'll forgive me. You forgive me. You love me. And Lord, I'll never quit on you. I'll follow you all the days of my life. And Holy Spirit, I ask you to help me to keep that promise. Keep me holy, God. And Jesus, I ask you to give me a heart to love you. I want to love you and love people around me, God. That's your Those are your commandments. Set me free to love others. Set me free to love you, Lord Jesus. Lord, give me a conviction of all my sin. Let me see the wickedness, the evilness, the vileness. I even want to know what it smells like to you, God. There's a putrid, wretched smell that comes off of me that is associated with my sins, that fills your nostrils that you can't tolerate. Lord, I, I even want to know what it smells like. And since you personify sin, you call it like a person. I want to know what it looks like. And I don't want anything more to do with it. Because I want you. I love you. I need you. Jesus, I ask for con 
conviction of everyone here today and every confessed sin. Lord, as they're pouring it out to you and they're sincere and not fake, God, and I pray, Holy Spirit, you carry this over every day of our life, that we are continually in a check mode to see what's wrong, and we keep pouring it back to you. We ask you for forgiveness, and by your blood, Lord, we believe in faith that our sins are forgiven and that we have eternal life. We praise you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Amen.